Good morning, class. Today we're going to be talking about properties. So we talked about last time encapsulation, we said that object orientation, objects and classes really build around that idea. And we're going to look at the first half of that, how do we get data into classes. And then we're going to specifically talk about C Sharp and some of the cool things that we can do with properties in that language. So at this point, go ahead and reopen your project from the encapsulation exercises. So you should be picking up from where we left off. It should look uh, pretty much like this, although you'll have the rest of your methods defined. And if we jump into a particular, uh, or into the vector struct, uh, remember last time I told you we'd use a struct because that was really how we were using it here. Now we're going to change gears. We're gonna turn this back into a class, which actually is extremely simple. We just come to our struct here and we rename it as a class. Done. Woo, that was easy. Uh, what this does for us is it behaves pretty much exactly like a struct. We still have three public fields that we're writing values to, and we have a constructor that's constructing the new object, in this case, instead of a structure, and putting those values into it. Now, when we made the shift to object orientation, and you saw this in your reading, one of the important ideas that we added was the idea of uh, information hiding or data hiding is another term we use for it. And the idea is we want to have more control over how the state of this object changes. And the key to doing that is instead of allowing public fields like this, uh, make these fields private. So these would then become private fields. And once we have those private, create methods to access their values. And in 200, you probably used getters and setters, where you declared a public method, uh, which returned the data type for get. And it was usually named something like get uh, x, for example. And then we would return from that your private x value. And of course, if we're doing C-sharp naming conventions, those should be lowercase. Um, Let's go ahead and do that just to be clear. X, Y, and Z. And because they're also private fields, our naming convention is to preface those with an underscore. And that just helps tell the programmer that those are intended to be private variables. And you would do uh, a similar thing for the set. Public uh, void set X, which would take a double of uh, and give the name. And we'd say underscore x equals that incoming x property. Okay. And I'm pretty sure you guys did this all throughout 200. This is the standard way of doing things like this in object orientation. And you might be asking, well, why do we want to do this? Why, what's the benefit? At this point, there is no benefit. You're absolutely right. We're not actually saving ourselves anything because the default value for a field and the of what these getters and setters are doing for us are exactly the same. But as our program evolves, as we add uh, constraints or thoughts about this, for example, we can do some kind of error checking in the set X body to say, that's not a valid uh, value. I don't want you to uh, actually be able to set that. For example, we could say if X equals double dot, not a number. So if we want to explicitly uh, not allow you to set th this value to not a number, we could just return at that point, which means we'll never actually set our private backing fields, so it will never change. Or we could throw an exception uh, to say that what you're trying to do is not allowed. So throw new not, or probably an argument exception, saying that, uh, in this case, uh, argument, our x must be a number, which not a number is not a number by definition. Or we could check for infinity and things like that. So this allows us to prevent our, pro our state of this particular object from being put into, uh, mutated into a form that is not valid for our program, which is going to cause all potential problems down the road for our program's ability to execute correctly. Uh, so this is really about making our code more robust and more reliable. Now, one of the common complaints we get from in, in directory programmers as they start learning this is, 
yeah, but that's a lot of work. I really don't want to have to do that. Just let me, why can't I just use the field? The fields are so much easier. I like easy. Well, you're not the only programmers that like easy. Uh, so a lot of languages have developed special accessor um, uh, syntax to simplify this process. Uh, so in C Sharp, our accessor uh, syntax that we use is called properties. So rather than declaring the git x and the git y ourselves, how we actually do this as a property is we go ahead and say public, and the type is going to be double, and we go ahead and give it our name, so in this case x, and then we write a git and a set. You might be wondering, what are those gits and sets? Well, those are actually just what these are. So instead of setting this double as x, we would change this to value, and value and value here and that's just a standard uh, but what we basically end up doing is taking these bodies and moving them up into the set and the get So that is, uh, whoops, I hit control B so it built. Uh, that is the property. Now what is this actually doing? Well, you notice that this is the same body as our git, and this is the same body as our set. And under the hood, when this gets compiled, the compiler actually creates a couple methods. And it creates a method called actually git underscore x and set underscore x, which are exactly these methods. They look exactly like this. Uh, they just take whatever the body was here and dumps it into these methods. Now you, we don't get to see these methods. We can't call these methods because they're built at compile time. They don't exist before that, but it's effectively the same thing as if we wrote those methods ourselves. Now the other aspect of how this works is when we do something like our console applications, let's go back to our vector math program here. When we say 1.x on this vector, that is actually going to invoke the get method that's created by the compiler. So the compiler will also replace this 1.x with a call to get x. What that means for us is that we can use these exactly the same way that we used fields in the syntax where we're actually working with the class. It, it's interchangeable. So it's, if you did have a program that was written all with fields and at some point you said, no, we need that extra control of properties, you can change them via property, the rest of your code doesn't have to change. That was a big, big thing for the early days of C-sharp development. Uh, so that's really one of the big ideas there. Now, good coding practices avoid those public fields even if you're not doing anything special with them, go ahead and use a property. Now, a lot of you are saying, well, I really don't want to write out that property, especially if it's not doing anything different than a field. There's another syntax that was introduced for properties called the auto property syntax. And let's do that for public double Y. So if you don't need to do any special checks in your setter, you can use this syntax. And we just declare the return type, the name, and then in brackets, get and set, say it's going to have both a get and a set. This is now uh, essentially the same as this line up here if we didn't have this. It's exactly the same code that will be generated. So now not only are we generating those methods, we're also generating the private backing field that goes with those methods at the compile time. Now the downside to this approach is you can no longer access the private backing field. It is just not available to you because it's done at compile time. But if you really need a simple uh, accessor and you don't need anything special about it, you just want to be able to store a value and retrieve a value, this is the easiest way to write that. If you want that value to have a default starting value, you can set that by just adding an equals in that default value. You do the same thing up here. You can actually do that with your private backing field. You can say that private x equals zero, and that is now effectively the same. And we don't need this private backing field for y because we're not using it. All right, so that is an auto property, and you can see this is a lot quicker to write if you don't need anything special to do anything special in the get or the set method. You need to do additional functionality there, then you need to go ahead and spell those out. Uh, the 
Other thing we can do is if you want to be able to change that value from within the class, but you don't want the outside world to be able to change that value, uh, well, one of the things we can do is we can just not have a setter if we're using this syntax, so just delete the setter, and then only that git is available from the, uh, out of the scenes, and inside the class we can change the private field directly. Now, if you're doing an auto property syntax, there's a little trick you can do where you say you want to make the setter private or protected when we get into uh, inheritance. So now, private set means that only this class can call its own setter. Everything outside of that just sees the getter. So we actually have the default public applying to the get, and we've overrided that private set. Now there's one more property uh, that was introduced, I think around C sharp nine. I should actually check my notes, to make sure that's right. It's called init. And init is very much like a setter, except it can only be called once, and it can only be called during initialization, so when you're actually constructing this class. So if you wanted to have a value that gets set when it gets constructed, and then you never use it again, or never change it again, uh, you could use the init accessor instead. And instead of having private set, that's actually a common use case where you say, oh, I want an initializer so I can change this value, but I don't want it to change at any point after that. That is uh, what we would call, at that point, your object is effectively, or your property is effectively immutable. It doesn't change, it can't mutate uh, once it's been set that first time. So that's the init one as well. We probably won't use that very much, but it's good to know it exists, and there are some times where it actually does make sense especially if you are trying to use more immutable coding practices, which is actually very common to the functional paradigm, not as much in the object-oriented paradigm, but it does solve a lot of particular problems, especially when we start doing um, multi-threaded code. Uh, so there are some times where that does come into play. All right, let's do uh, one more syntax. So uh, there is also expression-bodied getters and setters. Uh, so public double z. If we wanted to just return the value of z and not have a setter, this is one of the ways you can do it. This is called a lambda expression. We'll talk about those a little further along, but basically what it says is uh, it turns this into a method where this is the body of the method, and by default this is invoking just the git. Uh, you can actually use it for gets and sets. Not get bets, gets. There we go where we could return that uh, backing variable of z. And for our set, we would have, again, the body would be bringing in that value as a parameter. So we could say z equals value. Now, with expression-bodied properties, these really should be one line. If you're going to do more than one line, use this syntax. And you can actually use both. So if your set was simple, but your, or sorry, your git was simple, but your set was not, uh, we can actually replace this set with the expression bodied. We can say that z equals value, and then we could do our check up above where uh, value, if it equals double, not a number, and return. So just don't allow it to set it if it's not set. So you can actually mix and match those syntax. All right, so those are all of our different forms of properties in a nutshell. Uh, at this point, if we've done our properties correctly, we should be able to go ahead and run our tests and have them pass just like they would have when they were, we were using fields uh, because we really haven't changed how outside code interacts with that. So if, let's go look at our test explorer and notice that all of those tests are passing, so we know that that works correctly. And if we run our project, we should see the same output we saw that we set up before, uh, where it gives us the output, and everything runs exactly the same. So the big benefit of properties is really the idea that we can then control how those values get set, and we can do certain things when they change. So it allows us to really control how mutations occur within our object, and then how we can reply to those. So that's the big idea for how object orientation starts really impacting state. That all of our state changes should be triggered through method calls. Uh, so we are actually encapsulating our behavior along with the state. And then we can write other methods to do other interesting things with the classes as well. And that's really kind of the last piece of the encapsulation puzzle for um, uh, object orientation.
uh, along with the idea of data hiding, and we've talked about a couple of those uh, data hiding ideas already. We've talked about public, and we've talked a little bit about private. Public just means that this is accessible outside of the object. Private means only the object's code can actually see or use that value or call that method. Uh, then we can do the same thing uh, we've talked about internal, which says this is basically public to the assembly, uh, so the DLL or the executable we're building, but outside of that, it's not visible. So if you bring that project into another project as a dependency, you can't see that class, that variable, or that field. And those are really the big ideas for this particular unit. So hopefully that was clear. And uh, if you have questions, bring them to class. And we'll talk to you next time.